morning, good morning, and welcome to our gathering of church family this morning. We're so glad that you're here, and yes, I was just about to tell a story, and Robbie's like, it'll have to wait, we're going live. And I just love the fact that we still can have this sense of togetherness and family. I was online just chiming in, chatting with some of you, and then talking to Shelly, who's right here, and then Robbie and Tally, who are in uh, the producer's room. And it's just such a wonderful day to come together and to encourage one another and to encourage one another. So as you are watching from your device this morning, I encourage you just to welcome people, send messages, text messages. You might want to call someone who you don't see yet. And there are those of our church family who are watching on YouTube as well. So you might just want to, you know, send a text to someone and say, hey, are you on YouTube this morning? Uh, so I encourage you just to spend some time uh, physical distancing welcome. I know, right? It's the introvert's dream, right? No shaking of hands, no hugging, no having to move around in your seat, right? So I encourage you just to take a few minutes and welcome people. Uh, we want to say welcome back to Alfred and Abby and Temi and Tomi. They're back from Nigeria. And so we're so glad that they have arrived home safely and have been uh, in isolation for the last uh, two weeks. And so just a shout out to them and a thank you, God that they have returned home safely. And uh, and it's just been so cool to pray together on Wednesday evenings at prayer meeting. And, and as people send in their prayer requests to hear back answers to prayer and just knowing that God is moving in the hearts of our people. So if you have uh, things that you would like us to pray about on Wednesday nights, please send them to prayer at bfmc.org and we will love to pray for them. I love how we meet together on Wednesdays to pray. And always it's like we are privileged to go before uh, the throne of grace or before God for our church family and intercede for them. And I just love so much that God listens to our prayers. And so uh, a few announcements. If you are new to Barry for Methodist Church, this is your first day with us. Uh, and you're like, well, what is this church all about? Well, we are God's family knowing, growing, and serving in the love of Christ for the purpose of helping our community experience God's love. And our community isn't just our physical community, but it's also our online community. We just love having the opportunity of getting to talk about how much God loves us to every single person who listens. And so if you're new today, this is your first time, we encourage you to go over to bfmc.org. There's a I'm new here button. And if you have some questions or just you want to I want to say surf around on that website a little bit, see what we're about. Or if you want to actually scroll through our Facebook page, we encourage you to do that. But uh, we would love to get to know you a little bit more. So uh, leave us a note saying, hey, I was here and loved being part of your family this morning. Or you can just leave a little note in the bottom of uh, the live broadcast and just saying, hey, I'm new here. Loved the service this morning. So we encourage you to do that. And... Thank you so much for those in our church family that have been faithfully giving uh, to the ministry of our church. And as I was in our building this week, I walked through the kitchen and Louise was making cinnamon buns. So Louise is our kitchen ministry director and so heading up uh, the Cundles uh, breakfast program, making sure people in our community have food. And she was making cinnamon buns and banana bread and just muffins, and it smelled so good. And uh, I remember sitting with her one day, and uh, she has this heart for people, and she just loves feeding people. And she's like, I just like feeding people. And I'm like, I'm so glad that you do, and that people aren't relying on me to feed them, because they'd get chilly a lot and eggs and spaghetti. So I'm so thankful that we have people in our church family that love uh, feeding people and feeding people not just inside of our church but outside of our church. And so thank you so much because you faithfully give to our church family. We're able to minister and to help people in our community experience God's love. And so a few things that are coming up first is our virtual family camp, which is on August 16th to the 21st. And it's absolutely free. Uh, Bishop Cliff Fletcher is the special speaker. And uh, we're trying to make it as accessible as possible. So we have morning devos. There's a kid's moment. Uh, so morning devos. I'm hosting it. I'm not doing all of them, but I'm hosting it at, at 7 a.m. So join us then. 
they'll be on the live page on the Facebook page so you can check in throughout today or throughout the day in case you're not up at seven to see who was the special speaker at every morning's devos uh, then there's a kids moment at 9 30 then uh, a, a youth moment at one and then evening service and worship uh, begin at 7.30 in the evening, and then there will be a prayer service immediately following. So we encourage you to sign up for that. If uh, So you can go to our, face, our website and click on the link. Or if you've already signed up, we encourage you to invite your friends, all right? So invite your friends, because camp is this wonderful time. I'm asking you to set aside a week this summer just to make space for God, to hear God's voice, and... Uh, it's called the amazing race because in Hebrews it says, I'm going to throw off everything that hinders me and I'm going to press forward and press into God. And so that's why we do camp and that's why we're doing this week is to make space in our schedule to draw near to the Lord. And so we encourage you uh, to sign up and then to invite friends. Secondly, Landon, as you know, our youth and young adults ministry director is moving on in the next chapter of his life. He's at, literally moving out west uh, to be with family and to pursue school. So we are looking for an associate pastor. So we ask that you would be prayerfully um, bringing this to the Lord and just praying for the team that will be uh, interviewing prospective uh, pastors for this position because it is such a... Uh, an important position in our church so please be praying for that and so we're gonna pray we're gonna give thanks for um, your generosity we're gonna give thanks for how God has met with us and we're gonna give thanks for what he's going to do in and through our church community in the future so dear Lord Jesus thank you so much for today Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your grace. Thank you that you love us. And Lord, thank you for every single person that calls BFMC home, whether literally on our, in our community or online. And we ask that you'd bless and encourage them today. And Lord, for every person who has faithfully given, would you bless every uh, dollar and cent that has been given to your ministry here in Barrie and beyond. And Lord, that we would be good, uh, that we, we would use it wisely and that we would use it to help people uh, in their immediate need, but also in their spiritual need of growing closer to you. And so, Father, we lift up the, the virtual family camp that every single one of us would make space in our schedule to tune in and hear, uh, hear the speakers and allow your spirit to work in our hearts. And, Lord, we just ask for this associate pastor. We ask that you bless and encourage Landon as he uh, moves into this next chapter, but also you would prepare us for this next person that you have. And so, Lord, um, we just leave this in your hands and we trust you. And Lord, as we enter into worship uh, this morning, would you help us to connect with you? Would you help us to hear your voice? And Lord God, as, as Ruth Ann leads us in singing, that our hearts would be tender to you. And we ask this in your name. Amen. So hear the call to worship. We know that God is always with us, but sometimes we forget. And so as we come together this morning, let's remind ourselves that God is with us. And so let's read from Psalm 16, which says, I will praise the Lord who counsels me. Even at night, my heart instructs me. I keep my eyes open on the Lord with him at my right hand I will never be shaken therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices my body also will rest secure because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead nor will you let your faithful ones see decay you make known to me the path of life you will fill me with joy in your presence with eternal pleasures at your right hand so during this time of worship Worship, may our hearts be glad, may our souls rejoice, may our bodies rest secure, knowing that God shows us the path of life, and in God's presence, there is fullness of joy, and we are so glad to be together in God's presence today. Let's sing.
church family uh, let us pray Heavenly Father thank you so much for this time that we can come together and uh, even though we are far apart thank you that we live in a time where this is possible where we can still do church service and still be able to connect together in this way so thank you so much for this blessing and dear God thank you uh, for church family and we are a family because of you thank you for who you are dear God holy 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 are you Lord God Almighty maker of heaven and earth Thank you, dear loving, kind, merciful, gracious, holy Father and God, infinite and limitless in every way. Thank you for your amazing love, and that even though we've sinned against you and broken your commands and laws and heart time and time again, you still loved us, dear God, and you sent your only Son, Jesus, 
to save us. Dear Jesus, thank you for your victory on the cross. Thank you for your victory over sin, death, and the devil, and for taking the authority away from him to give to us. Thank you that by your wounds we are healed. And dear God, thank you that you are not a distant God. Uh, you're a God who invites us to an intimate relationship with you. Dear Jesus, thank you for making it possible for your Holy Spirit to live in us. And we pray, dear God, that your Holy Spirit would work freely in us. Remind us of our identity in you, that we are created in your image, and that you have a purpose and a plan for us. So help us, dear God, uh, to shine your light. And dear Jesus, you taught us to pray for your kingdom to come. And so, dear God, we pray that your kingdom would come to our streets, to our neighborhoods, to our city, to our nation. Uh, help us to know how to participate in that plan, dear God. And we pray for many uh, would come to know you and accept you as their Lord and Savior. Dear Jesus, you also invited those who are weary and heavy laden um, that you would give them rest. And some may be finding themselves that way, uh, carrying heavy loads, whether it's regarding jobs or finances or relational or spiritual issues. Dear God, we pray for the grace to do that exchange where they would experience your rest. And dear Father, help us to, uh, to keep watch, to guard our hearts from the evil one, from from his deception and his lies and his discouragement. Help us to rest uh, and trust in your, uh, in your strength and to only hope in you, dear God. We thank you, dear Jesus, for also for the, for the positive news that we heard this week about the decreasing number of uh, COVID cases. Uh, dear Father, we pray that you, that you be with our leaders and those in authority, guide them in the decisions that they have to make and, uh, and as they manage the situation. And dear God, we pray for an end to this pandemic. Thank you again that we can meet like this. Uh, prepare our hearts, dear God, to receive your message. And we pray to help us to apply it to our lives. We thank you, we love you, and we praise you. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Steve and Ruth Ann, for leading us in worship. And I know you've heard me say this before, but I really hate waiting. And yes, I do apologize to everyone who I have made wait, because I can tend to do that. Uh, but I really don't like waiting. In fact, one of my memories of really not liking to wait is I remember sitting on the front step of my parents' home in probably grade seven or eight, and they weren't home and I didn't have a key and I'm waiting and waiting and waiting and I'm thinking why are they not here do they not care like come on they need to let me in the house and I don't even know how long I was sitting out front uh, but really it's small town eastern Ontario like what was gonna happen an alligator come and get me I don't know I was just miffed that they were taking so long and so literally I saw them drive in and I'm like, what happened? And dad said, you should have seen the size of the boa constrictor across Highway 7, squeezing all of the cars that went by. So we had to take the long way home. And I was like, dad, you're just late. Can't you just say you're late? And uh, dad had a way of telling stories to get himself out of things. Um, but I remember him very clearly telling me that story to justify uh, me waiting. Because more often than not, my dad was the one waiting. There were three women in the house, my sister, my mom, and myself. And so let's just say that bathroom time was very limited for my dad. Like more often than not, he would get in there to do something and somebody would knock on the door and say, Dad, we need to use the bathroom. And he'd be like, can you wait? Nope. So dad would wait. Dad would go out, sit in his, in his room waiting. And so I have so many memories of coming out of the bathroom and seeing my dad just waiting, usually with half of his face shaved and the other half waiting to be shaved or his hair like half combed, just waiting. Dad was a really good waiter. He just knew how to wait. Uh, mind you, he grew up with five sisters and then had a wife and two daughters, so he knew what it was like 
to wait to get into. We had one bathroom. And so I wanted to just share that story with you because God waits too. Um, in Isaiah 30, 18, it says, Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Uh, therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all those who wait for him. But the Bible says he longs to wait for us. Second Peter um, or he longs to be gracious to us. Second Peter 3, 9 says, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come into repentance. He waits for us because he wants to be known by us. He wants to be in relationship with us. And so he waits for us to, to turn to him. And the single greatest privilege in life is to know God. The God who formed us, provides for us, and sent his son to die for our sins longs to be in real relationship with every single one of us and longs to be known by you. Not just superficially known, but like deeply, intimately known. And through the power of Christ's sacrifice, we can truly know God like we would any other person. And in fact, in some respects, he's infinitely noble more than any other person. Jeremiah 31 says this, but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their, their sins no more. Like God says, I'm going to invite you into relationship. Like I'm going to be inside of you, leading you, guiding you, directing you in relationship. And it says in that passage, from the least to the greatest, says the living God. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, you can know the God of love. Knowing God is no longer reserved just for those people. Um, who are appointed as leaders, but it's open for anyone who would come to him. All of us can have equal access to God. And so from a place of knowing God, we are given the ability to experience his incredible attributes and be blessed by an even greater awareness of our relationship with him. When we seek to know him, the Bible is clear that we can begin to experience his love. That's Romans 5, 5. We can hear his voice and know it, John 10, 27, and feel his peace, 2 Thessalonians 3, 16. We can partner it with him in 1 Peter 2, 9 and experience his freedom in Romans 6, 4. And then we can rest in his presence, Psalm 16. When we focus our lives on knowing God, we get to know him so, so well. And it's so good. But he waits for us to turn to him. He doesn't force himself on us. He's always there waiting for us to desire to know him. So let me tell you a story from Luke 15. And for many of you, you will know the story by the title, The Parable of the Prodigal Son. But I'm going to say that it's actually the story about a prodigal father. A father who starts, who, who has just lavishes love recklessly on his two sons for the purpose of being in relationship with them. So I'm going to show uh, a video first. And so what I want you to do, and kids, let's see if you can beat your parents to this. But what I want you to do is type in some words as you watch it that describe the father, not the physical attributes because it's a cartoon, but what are some words that describe how the fa who the father is and how he interacts with his kids. So let's watch this from Saddleback Kids. Let's Stories of the Bible, the prodigal son. This is Jesus. hey -o who is the Son of God and the Savior of the world. While Jesus was on earth, he taught everyone about God's love. He healed many people from their sickness, performed many miracles like calming storms, 
and even raised people from the dead. Jesus taught everyone about God's love. All kinds of people would come to hear Jesus speak, including tax collectors and people who made bad choices. This made the Pharisees and Jewish leaders mad. Ugh, yuck. They didn't think that Jesus should be around these kind of people. So Jesus told them this story. A man had two sons. The younger son told his father, Um, excuse me? I want my share of your estate now, before you die. Okay. So his father agreed and gave his son his inheritance. A woohoo! A few days later, this younger son packed all his belongings. See ya! And moved to a distant land. And there he wasted all his money in wild living. Huh? About the time his money ran out, a great famine swept over the land. Aw, oh, man! And he began to starve. Hey, you! He convinced a local farmer to hire him. Thank you! And the man sent him into his fields to feed the pigs. The young man became so hungry that even the food he was feeding the pigs looked good to him. But no one gave him anything. Finally, he said to himself, At home, even the servants have food enough to spare, and here I'm dying of hunger. I know! I will go home to my father and apologize and ask him to take me on as a servant. So he returned home to his father. And while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. Filled with love and compassion, he ran to his son. Sir! His son said to him, Father, I have sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him. Get a ring for his finger and sandals for his feet, and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast, for this son of mine was dead and now has returned to life. He was lost, but now he is found. So the party began. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Meanwhile, the older son was in the fields working. When he returned home, he heard music and dancing in the house. Huh? Hey, you! And he asked one of the servants what was going on. Your brother is back, he was told, and your father has killed the fattened calf. We are celebrating because of his safe return. Woohoo! All right! Party time! All right! Yahoo! The older brother was angry and wouldn't go in. His father came out and begged him. Ah, oh, man! But he replied, all these years I've slaved for you and never once refused to do a single thing you told me to. And in all that time, you never gave me even one young goat for a feast with my friends. Yet when this son of yours comes back after wasting your money, you celebrate by giving him a great feast. His father said to him, Look, dear son, you have always stayed by me and everything I have is yours. We had to celebrate this happy day. For your brother was dead and has come back to life. He was lost, but now he is found. <laughs> oh, there's so many things that I really enjoy about that video. So, but what you're typing in is characteristics of the father, right? So you, as you watch that video, what are some characteristics of the father that you saw towards uh, both sons. And so I'll wait for you as you type those in. Uh, but I just, yeah, I just love watching these videos because it just, yeah, makes me happy and smile. And, and it helps to, I want to say, tell the story in a different way because sometimes you just need the same story told by different voices and you pick up different things. So, uh, Generous. The father was generous. 
towards his son. Love. Anything else? Uh, forgiveness. Yes. Uh, patient. Yes. Anything else? Any other characteristics that you saw in uh, the father towards the son? Sons? Um, yes, I agree. Love and generosity and patience. Uh, love, forgiveness, kind, smart, understanding. Yes. Like so often, and because it's called the prodigal son in most Bibles, in mine it says the lost son, but the focus is on the son. But I really feel for today, we're going to re retitle it and t call it the prodigal father. And prodigal literally means um, wasteful or reckless or spendthrift. And when you think about the love that the father lavishes on both of his sons, actually, um, it makes sense that he would be called the prodigal father because in that day and age, and, and so we're going to pick up uh, reading. So if you have your paper Bibles, um, or if you have another device, uh, so Luke 15, in that day and age, uh, Luke 15, verse 11, uh, so Jesus is speaking to the tax collectors and the Pharisees, and the Pharisees are a little miffed that Jesus is spending so much time, and that's why he tells so much time with the tax collectors and the sinners, because they're like, hey, like you shouldn't be spending time with them, and so Jesus tells them this story about uh, this parable, which is a reflection of, of who God is and how God loves everyone. And it says, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons, all right, two sons. And it says, the younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate. So he, so that was seen as a huge no-no in that day and age that basically, because it would be when the father would die, that the estate would be divided up two portions for the eldest son and then one portion for uh, those that were younger. And so basically the younger son is saying, I want your stuff and I want it now. So basically meaning I want you to die. That's what it's saying. And so um, there was a man who did a whole bunch of research when he was in the Middle East and would ask about this parable to everyone he came into contact with. And he said, if that was to happen today, what would happen? And everyone responded that son would get a beating. <laughs> like that was not appropriate for that son to ask for his father's, uh, for, to ask for his portion of the estate. But what I find mo even more interesting is that it says, so the father divided his property between them. And in all the commentaries that I looked at, at all the sermons and devotions that I looked at, very few people actually address that line. And I find it shocking that, because as I read that line, I'm like, but why? If, if the common response would have been uh, becoming an outcast, kicking him out of the family, um, or a physical beating, the father actually agreed to do what the son asked him to do. And so it got me, got me thinking a little bit about why. Why did he do that? Because he didn't have to. In fact, the right response would have been to say, like, no. But I believe that the father divided the land and there was no grief. There, there was no anger, there was no hatred, but out of love, because he desired to be freely loved by his son, to be truly known by his son, and to reveal his character would be to divide the land. And ultimately, um, this is a story of how God loves us, because God's first and foremost attitude towards us is one of love. Love is his supreme ethic. And everything that God does is because he loves us. And where there is the possibility of love, there must also be the possibility of free will, or it's not love. Where there's the possibility of free will, there is the possibility of sin and hurt and pain. And so this 
father wanted to be freely loved by his son. So as a result, he freely releases him, divides up his, prof his property, basically humiliating himself because um, he is doing what his son is asking him to do. And then, so it would have been based in land, not necessarily a whole lot of money. So he would have had to sell off property and in the community go around and ask people to buy it. And the people in the community would have been like, what? What are you doing this for? So the father humiliated himself in the eyes of the community because that's not what the right response was. But because he loved his son, he chose to humiliate himself. He chose to demean himself in the eyes of the community so that he could show his son how much he loved him. The father knew he needed to release the son if he was ever going to have a real relationship with him. I just, and so he humiliated himself. And then verse 13 to 20, I, I titled Party Time. That's where the younger son just goes off. And it says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had and set off for a distant country and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country and he began to be in need because his money ran out. So he went and hired himself uh, to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired men have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired men. So he got up and went to his father. The son didn't, still didn't understand the father's heart. The, fa the son, when he received uh, his inheritance, he just took it, not even looking back, never even thinking once about what the father had to endure in order to give him his inheritance. Because you see that in what he says. He's like, I'm going to dust myself off and go back and ask my father, right? Like basically beg my father to at least give me a job so I can pay back what I owe him, right? He saw himself as working his way out of the debt that he owed his father. So he saw it more as a, a monetary transaction than one of relationship. But verse 20, uh, I love the way it falls out here because it starts off saying, so he got up and went to his father, but while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him and kissed him. And it's like this, the father had not forgotten about his son. In fact, he longed for his son to return. He was hoping and praying that his son would return. And when he saw him, he was filled with compassion. And this is something we don't realize again, but he humiliated himself for a second time because he would have had to, well, it says he ran. And the reason he ran is because he wanted to be the first one to get to his son because he knew, he knew that as his son started coming through, people from the village would see him. And they were not happy with the son who had humiliated his father and had gone against all of their customs. So he was concerned that the community was basically going to probably stone or beat his son. And so there's this dad who's been looking for his son every day. And as soon as he sees him, he lifts up his robes. So that tells me he was a rich man because he had long robes. He lifts them up and he showed his ankles. It doesn't say that, but if you lift up your robes, you're going to show your ankles. And that was like really humiliating because rich men in that day and age, in that culture, never let their ankles be shown. They always walked everywhere. And not, so he picks up his robes and he runs to his son and he falls on him, hugging and kissing him. The word in the Greek says literally again and again and again and again and again. And I know uh, whenever I see 
my mom for the first time, right? I just want to squeeze and hug her so tightly, right? Because I'm so happy to see her. Well, this dad was so happy to see his son. And his son starts to recite the speech, right? Like, hire me. Like, he just starts. And before he even gets halfway through it, it says, um, the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, quick, right? He doesn't even let him get through. Doesn't even let him get through the speech. Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and found. So they began to celebrate. So what's really important here is the father is declaring that the son has been restored and not because of anything the son has done, but because of the humiliation that the father has endured. Because the robe, it says, bring the best robe. The best robe would have been owned by the father. And remember, he had been with pigs. He stank so badly. And yet the father puts the best robe around him, signifying acceptance, signifying belonging. He puts a ring on his finger, which signified authority. So he actually had authority in that home again. And he put sandals on his feet, which signaled he was not going to work for his place in the family because um, only like free men used sandals. Servants and slaves did not wear shoes. And so this father humiliates himself again in front of the community because they're like, what is going on, right? Why are you demeaning yourself for your son? And it's because he loves his son, because he wants to be in relationship with his son. And at this point, I'm wondering if the son is finally grasping how high and wide and long and deep is the father's love for him. I'm wondering if he's realizing that nothing that he does will ever separate himself from, from the love that his father has for him. I'm wondering if he's starting to get that his father loves him. And, and those passages of scripture from Ephesians 3.18 and Romans 8.38, right? I am convinced because we apply them to our lives, right? God loves us so much that he's willing to humiliate himself for us. Right, even though we can, our our sin can be so overt. When we come to Him, and we begin to confess our sin in His grace, He overwhelms us, and He puts on a, a robe of righteousness. We are made right in Christ. Right, He gives us authority. Right, and then He says, "You're part of the family. You're part of the family." Oh, what love the the Father has lavished on us that we might become children of God is what 1 John says. And so uh, now the son has a choice at this point to receive the Father's love or to like back up and say, no, no, no. And I love that verse. It says, so they, be, so they went in, so they began to celebrate. The son chose to receive the love that the Father had given and so this brings us to the elder son, right? A man had two sons. So let's read it. It says uh, in verse 25, Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. While he came, when he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because uh, he, has, he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look, all these years I have been slaving for you and never and never disobeyed your orders. You yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when the son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again, was lost and is now found. The brother was so angry. They were so angry because he didn't understand his father's heart. 
either. And you hear this in the words that he uses, right? All these years, I've been slaving for you, never disobeying you. It wasn't out of a heart of love or relationship. It was from a heart of a slave, right? So the, the, the older brother had this mentality um, that, you know what, I'm going to work hard for this property. But he actually didn't want a relationship with the father. He missed he missed it the same way the younger son had missed it too. So with the return of his brother, he was actually afraid that he was going to lose out on his inheritance. And so he's angry. And fear always leads to anger. So even though he had spent all those years with the father, he never understood the father. He figured that as long as he was good and did all the right things, that he would be successful but as a result, totally missed the love of the Father. And we can apply that to what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, right? The Pharisees who knew the law of God. They could teach the law so clearly, but they totally missed out on the God who was behind the law, right? It's not about following all the rules. It's about following the person who made the rules. And why did he make them? Because he loves us and wants us to be safe. But the heart is to be in relationship, that nothing would hinder relationship with God and others. And so that's why the rules were there. But they were simply following the rules to follow the rules, not to follow God. They understood the rules, but didn't understand the Lord. They didn't think about pursuing God. They pursued self-righteousness, unlike King David, who says, it's the Bible says he was a man after God's own heart, just wanted to know God. And you see that, like, yeah, he made mistakes, but his heart was to know God. And so the elder son simply saw himself as a slave to the father, waiting for him to die so that he could be the owner of the land. And his anger reflects this. He's like, I was good. I did everything I was supposed to do. You owe me. And so this morally good son was just as lost as the overtly sinful son. And so what does the father do? Well, this is the third time that the father has been humiliated because the role of the older son was actually to be welcoming to the guests. And here the father had to humiliate himself one more time to go out and talk to his son because he loved him. He had been waiting a long time for a relationship with this son as well. But his older son didn't understand what that meant. He just felt, well, I just have to do everything right. He didn't seek to know his father's heart. The father affirms the son. He says, you have always been with me and everything I have has been yours. I'm not taking anything away from you. You've always had access to everything I've had. You just simply didn't ask. And throughout scripture, um, there's this idea of when we turn to God, he comes. When we seek God, we find him. When we ask, we receive all throughout scripture. We, and, and so we can get really upset because we think, well, you know, why isn't God showing up and why isn't God doing things? And the thing is, did we ask? Did we seek God and did we seek God for who he is or did we seek him out of a selfish motivation in our hearts? So this story is about a father who waits to be truly loved by his family. And love is the supreme ethic when it comes to God. Where the possibility of love exists, there is the reality of, of free will. Where there is the reality of free will, there is the inevitability of sin. Where there is sin, there needs to be a savior. And where there is a savior, there is always hope for redemption. And three times in this story, the father comes, right, to save his kids for a relationship. This story had two sons, and both were alienated from their father, and both needed redemption. One was very overtly sinful, and one was very overtly good. But both didn't understand the father's heart and both were separated from him. God is not a grim patriarch. He is like the dad in the story, longing to be known by his kids and would do anything to be in relationship with us. And we can't earn it. 
There is no payment that we could ever give. It is simply a free gift. It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God, the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So when we choose to be in relationship with God, realizing that we have uh, hmm, sinned, done our own thing, sought to be our own savior, when we have overtly, you know, as, as the younger son did, overt sin, or maybe we've just, like the older son, been trying to be really good. If we're just good enough, that'll be okay. Both equally sinful because they separate us from God and they put us in the driver's seat in our life. And God's like, you'll never get anywhere in your life if you don't surrender those things to me and come to me. And in his faithfulness, he extends grace to us for anyone who will receive it. And Revelation uh, 3.20 says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any of you opens the door, I will come in and I will eat with you. And in ancient culture, that was a sign of acceptance to have a meal with someone. And that's why the tax, tax collectors were so upset with Jesus because he was eating with these sinners. Jesus was saying, no, I'm accepting them. I'm loving them. And so we have that, that choice today that in all of his majestic splendor, the Lord knocks on the door of our heart and says, will you enter into relationship with me? Will you recognize the roads that you have been going down trying to get everything that you need, but really your fullness of life comes from being in relationship with me and I will fulfill all of those needs? Are you willing to turn to me? Are you willing? And he waits for us to respond. He waits for us to respond. And so will we respond to that, that knock? And, and to be honest, I've, I've always, I would be in the elder brother category, always doing the right thing. But do I truly understand the heart of God for me? And so I know that's something that I've had to surrender to Jesus. To say, Lord, I know I get caught up in doing the right thing. I'm a rule follower, but I want to understand your grace. Would you help me to do that? And uh, if you are more, I want to say, on the younger brother side of things, or you've just been doing your own thing, and you're like, this is not satisfying either, then I invite you to come to Jesus and, and repent of those sins, just like I had to repent of, of doing, thinking doing the right thing would get me, you know, check marks in God's good book. No, the, fact, the mere fact that he's created us means that he loves us, wants to be in relationship with us. So let me pray. So Heavenly Father, I come to you, and, and Lord, everyone falls into two of these camps, either like just separated from you or trying to do the right thing, but with the wrong motivation. And at, at one point, every single person has fallen into these camps. And so, Father, your word says that if we turn away from our sins, turn to you, then our sins will be wiped away and a time of refreshing will come. And so, Father God, I just ask that we would respond to your, to your knock, to your love, to your humiliation. Um, the fact that you give up everything in situations that just don't make sense in order to reach out to us, to extend your grace and your forgiveness at a very, very costly price of Jesus dying on the cross for our sins. He, will, he willfully suffered humiliation on the cross so that we could be made right with you. And so, Father, I ask in your name that we would turn to you. No matter where we're at on the scale, whether uh, a younger brother or an elder brother, whether overtly sinning or you know, holding on to our good works, um, Lord, both separate us from you. So would you help us to respond to you today? We ask this in your name. Amen. So I encourage you uh, to think about, to read over the story and just say, Lord, where, where do I fit in here? Is there a sin in my life that's separating me from you? Would you reveal it? Or have I been relying on my good works and thinking that you owe me something? Mm. But I encourage you to sit with this text this week and continue. Uh, I put up 
a, a waiting on God challenge last week of all the different uh, verses. And I loved working through them this week with you on some of our morning devos. So I encourage you to continue to tune in to our morning devos tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to look uh, at more of those devos. So join us. So this week, may you be encouraged body, soul, and spirit because God loves you and he is able to do immeasurably more out of the abundance of your of his great love for you than you could ever imagine or hope for. All right, my dear friends, we'll see you later. Have a great day. Bye. Thank you for joining us for our online service today. If you haven't already, please like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to us on YouTube as well. And that'll ensure that you get all of our posts and alerts. If you'd rather join us on your smart TV, well, subscribe to us on YouTube, and then you'll be able to tune in live every Sunday morning right from your TV. If you aren't on any of those services but still want to connect with us, check out our website, bfmc.org, or email info at bfmc.org to request information. Thank you for supporting the ministry of BFMC. You can give online or drop off a check at the church office. For more information about giving, please email giving at bfmc.org. We're so glad that you could join us today. Now, go help our community experience Christ.